Greetings, tour friends. Today, let's do a tier list of all the European sword makers. We have a lot on our plate, so let's get on with it. Disclaimer first, this is my list, my personal take. Feel free to disagree and share your experience down below in the comment section. Please remain respectful to all the makers, obviously, but also to commentators. So, Matthew Jensen, Kyle of Alien Dude, and Bacon John of Ashis Sword Reviews plan to do our own separate tier list in our own videos and there's a planned live stream probably on a weekend to exchange our ideas so stay tuned for that live stream and please do know that we already did a tier list for all the Japanese sword makers and link in the description below and check that out because it's a very instructive video for you to understand the active players on the market now Let's get on with it. First, let's establish some bottom line, right? The industrial standard of modern reproductions of European historical swords and what you can expect from the contemporary maker's work. First on the list is Albion swords, which is very convenient for me as Albion is pretty much the golden standards of the sword reproduction industry, as they have already established their reputation through decades of good work. Their swords are primarily designed by Swedish swordsmith Peter Johnson through decades of his personal research projects and also exchange with other sword makers uh, based on antique originals at museums or private collections. And their swords, such as this, Albion Sovereign I'm holding right now are universally beloved by collectors, practitioners. They're taken to historical European martial art tournaments to compete in cutting competitions, and they have won countless laurels. So very much so, all the makers' work have to be compared to Albion's in order to pass the sniff test. And obviously, we're going to put Albion swords in tier S. I think that's pretty much undisputed. Nobody have any disagreement of that. Do know that their workshop is located in Wisconsin, US. They do their sort primarily from computer numerically controlled processes to initially draw all the shapes. And then they have a group of very skilled labor to do all the grinding work. Their swords have excellent mass distribution based on many historical originals, and they also cater to modern audience sensibility of how swords should handle. So in a sense, they represent the average of medieval swords. They're not that hefty, even though some of the types, such as a sovereign, is considered somewhat on the heavier end of the spectrum. Others are rather lightweight, but they are mostly sticking to the historical average which is very pleasing to modern audience. You can see the reason why they are very respected, pretty much the principe of the industry. And Albion happens to be my personal favorite as well. Personally, I own 16 pieces from them. And you can see many of them on the wall in my office, but also in other displays. I just enjoy their look and feel that invoke the ideal of medieval historical originals. Next up on the list is sort of an opposite of Albion Source, Angus Trim. He has also been the OG master of source missing in the industry, has already established a pretty solid reputation among the historical European martial art practitioner crowd. And his swords are usually taken to tournaments for cutting competitions. And they have also won lots of laurels alongside Albion swords. Also, Angstrom is one person that has contributed a lot of his knowledge within the community. His opinions are highly respected. He is such a cool guy, was originally in the hot rod hobby or business fine-tuned commercially available cars into race cars and 
you can see some of his philosophies in the sword making field. And he likes to fine tune his examples to the degree that they handle extremely well. And I believe Gus once mentioned that he met his wife on a race. So he's a machinist at heart. You can see many of the traits of his swords shared with Albion. And I believe Angus Trin was one of the sword makers there to teach Albion how to use CNC to make sword blades. When Albion transitioned from using Dell team blades to in-house production, executing Peter Johnson's designs. And Gus Trim has an emphasis on the handling of the sword. His swords are usually very lightweight, nimble. That's almost on the extreme end of the spectrum, probably equivalent to the most lightweight and lively fitting swords among his historical originals. He freely admits that living on the West Coast, situated in Washington State, he doesn't have as many opportunities as some of the other makers to examine antique originals in museums, but he has gotten solid data and measurements from other makers. He is also a practitioner himself uh, of both Chinese swordsmanship, but also European swordsmanship. Not to mention that he also worked very closely with many <laughs> instructors and competitors in the HEMA field, such as Philip Martin and Brittany Reeves, aka St. Levy. Obviously, his swords perform extremely well in test cutting, including in tournaments, but the central tenant is not to create competition level cutting swords, but designing them to handle like natural extensions of your arm. I own several pieces by Angus Trim, such as this uh, Type 18B by his own typology. I think this qualifies as a Type 18A or 18C, extremely broad bladed sword. It handles both with authority and agility, which is quite difficult to come by. If you look at the falchion on the wall there with the blue grip, it's the French medieval falchion, that sword is truly magical in its handling. It has a lot of authority when you swing it, having a somewhat forward balance, but, but there's a lot of trick in the mass distribution to fine tune the blade, to move in a way that not only it carries a lot of authority to do the work for the user when you cut with it, but it's also very easy to stop and redirect. So it almost feels like the sword has a life on its own. I know that sounds goofy, but if you have handled Gus Trim's many pieces, you understand what I mean. So highly recommended. Nice. Overall, the specialty of many of his models is that they are designed to carry high terminal velocity, so high top speed, and an ease to reach that velocity very quickly, at the same time requiring less effort to stop and redirect, which makes them extremely nimble dueling swords. So high top speed, high acceleration, does that sound familiar to some of the enthusiasts in race cars? I think there's no surprise that he used to be in the hot riding business to fine-tuning those race cars. Now, some of their pieces are in the category of being authoritative war swords, great cutters. However, the majority of them are in the nimbler, agile category as being lively dueling swords. However, there's a caveat. His swords usually have very typical fit and finish uh, that I talk about in the past that on first glance, they may feel somewhat plain. However, if you are a practitioner, you understand it carries a perfect dimension and the geometry, such as tapering in many dimensions. You can see the grip is fine-tuned for adapting different users' uh, anatomy, hand sizes, and their preferences. Now, many have made the observation that Angus Trim swords have relatively simplistic hilt components. Now, if you want uh, complex hilt designs like on Renaissance complex hilt swords or earlier migration era or Viking era swords with elaborate hilt designs, Angus Trim is probably not the place for you. Now, these hilt components are there to be functional and meet the historical standards of medieval swords. The primary focus of his swords is to have the best handling within the typology 
In that sense, his swords are analogous to perhaps some high-end luxury brands of sports equipment, especially for HEMA practitioners. And these different types of wheel pommel are the most common types found on late medieval swords. So I would say that the proportion and the geometries are very pleasing. But if you like his swords, the mass distribution on the blade, but you, you want the more elaborate help, you can just request bare blades from him, heat treated and ground, fine-tuned to carry that perfect handling. But then you can find this hillsmith to rehilt his swords. Actually, it's a pretty common practice. Even Gustrim himself has already been working with good makers such as Valiant Armory for decades now and sharing many of his designs of blades for them to come up with more innovative, um, just basically fancier fittings with different types, such as sand stopper bumbles, uh, but also hilt components inspired by fantasy works such as the Lord of the Rings, uh, Game of Thrones. If you look at the Great Sword of War, just above my monitor in the back, it's uh, made by Valley Armory. I believe the blade is supplied by Angus Trim, and they replicate one of his Type 13A. They come up with a hill aesthetically inspired by Ned Stark's ice and his battle swords from the TV series. So that came up really well. Not to mention that Gus Trim has been designing swords for other makers, such as Kingston Arms, which is an offshoot of Hanway. We'll talk about them later. And also Valley Armory to have his own line of production swords that's designed by him, but also take feedback uh, of hilt component designs by Valley Armory to come up with basically more diverse looking swords, but still carries 99% of the handling of Gus Trim's own work. And I believe he has suffered a stroke sometime in the last decade. So he semi-retired, but then he came back into sword making and only improved since then. So that's definitely something you should respect. He's also a very active member in the community. You can always chat with him. Even given his seniority, he doesn't really need to listen to anyone, but I have done reviews of his swords in the past and he actually reached out to me after watching them, told me that he has taken my advice, such as dulling the edges on these cross guards to make them more comfortable to handle. Then you just have to give the guy credit as he actively improves his craft. Even today, after decades of sword making, he's still on an upward trajectory. And you can only expect better work from him as the time progresses. So definitely a tier S for me. Next up, we're going to talk about arms and armor. Oh boy, that's one old guard of sword making. You will notice that I'm holding a pole hammer by Arms and Armor. And basically, I don't currently own any Arms and Armor sword pieces, but understand that the name Arms and Armor already tells you they're not exactly only focusing on swords. They are a company that does pretty much all custom work of historical, not just swords, but also arms, pole arms, axes, percussive weapons like maces and warhammers, but also armor, which is extremely cool. They have their own lines of production swords, like stock models you can order, but they also do custom works. Customers can request changes on the hilt components, but also on the blades. You can also do full custom work based on any given historical originals or even ones found in artworks. Now that's just extremely cool. On top of that, they are also doing a lot of community service by having a YouTube channel, but also a Sketch Lab account, publishing lots of the 3D scan of the original medieval swords in Oakshoff's collection. Now, Arms and Armor is one of the old guard of historical Arms and Armor reproduction makers. Back then in the days, I think they started their business in 1980s when active players in the modern markets such as Albion didn't even exist back then, at least not in the current capacity. Your Oakshot 
personally handled some of their pieces and commented that these are the finest historical sword replicas he had ever handled. Now, that's high praise, given how experienced the man is handling historical originals. Now, after York Oakshaw's death, Arms Army inherited many of his pieces and founded the Oakshaw Institute, so doing a lot of educational work within the community. And they are publishing many of the stats of the original source measurements and provide them freely to the public. That's extremely cool. They're not hoarding these information for themselves. But that created some of the problems. You see, they have many stock models based on Oakshaw's collection. And you would think that a maker of their caliber should be able to make one-to-one -one replicas, but you would be wrong. Some of the pieces end up in collector's hands, such as one of these Type 18 swords in the Oakshaw's collection, replicated by Arms of Armor, turned out to be a little inaccurate, right? mostly in the blade. You see, they tend to use thinner stocks for blades than the originals, right? The, even the direct replication, such as this Type 18 arming sword, the original has a base thickness of close to eight millimeters and tapers down dramatically in the thickness, just like many Type 18 swords. And that ensures their maneuverability right, with these very pronounced distal taper alongside the profile taper. Now, the reproduction by Arms of Armor does not have that. And I'm not sure whether they had access to that original one when this specific piece was made, but this is kind of problematic. If you start off the stock at around five millimeters, that's you're missing much of the mass at the base and the blade doesn't taper as much. You see, this way the blade doesn't have the correct handling characteristics as the original. And it will also have different flex. So it will handle and perform it, just basically cut and thrust in different ways. And that's a shame. But I also got information from collectors like Master Jensen that pieces like the Schloss Erbach Type 18B sword has been improved over time. So I think when they have the access to pieces in the Oak Shop collection, they tend to improve their craft over time. Now, their look and feel is quite different from many contemporary modern makers such as LBN or Valiant Armory. Um, they claim that their swords are all hand forged, right? hand forged blades. And of course, uh, the hilts crafting are always made by hand, but their grip material and the wrapping is quite different from many of the modern collector's favorites. They don't usually have the court wrap, it's just a plain leather wrap. So that's a little bit similar to many of the older makers such as uh, Deltan or Windless. They just don't have very elaborate hilts. But I have seen many conflicting reports. Some customers absolutely love their work, especially many of the Renaissance period swords. Those are not made frequently by production makers, uh, such as the Munich Tongar sword with the steel wire wrap. Those are done extremely well, and they are very close to originals, not just in look, but also in construction method and handling. Probably the prettiest looking sword in my collection so far. But there are other swords, such as rapiers, they just don't have the correct base thickness. And I don't know why, since their swords are all hand forged, it should be relatively easy for them to have the correct mass distribution distal taper. Feel free to disagree. I think their production stock models should be ranked between A and B. Some pieces are definitely superior and beloved. Others are, shall we say, have room for improvements. But their custom pieces are extremely well done. And for all the work, the community service they do for free and all the adaptability for creating diverse types of arms armor, I think they should get credit for that. To me personally, as a maker and company, they get an S, right? And that doesn't mean that all of their pieces, their swords are perfect. I already elaborated that. I think many of their stock models have room for improvement. 
Um, and some of the pieces are not exactly fan favorite, shall we say. But still, as a company and organization, the Oakshot Institute, I think they definitely deserve an S. So we have established pretty much the golden standards of the industry now. Shall we go through the rest of the list alphabetically? Now, first on the list is Angel Sword. That's a can of worm nobody wants to open. Now, Angel Sword is primarily a Renaissance Fair sword setter maker. Now, I'm pretty sure many of my viewers and members of the community will be offended or scandalized just by us featuring Angel Sword in the same video as these other credible and reputable makers and even mentioning them in the same breath as some of these names will insult and horrify makers but I encourage you to keep an open mind give them the benefit of the doubt and they make rather unconventional swords very different from historical swords and sell them for a very considerable amount often in multitude of thousands now if you sell swords that not only do not look like historical originals but also do not handle like them often overweight for their sizes having a arming sword that handles like a two-handed sword that doesn't even handle like a two-handed sword it weighs as much six pounds but most of them do not have the distal taper and the correct profile and they have almost zero regard for the typology for the time period and they also present them as historical swords they just name them arming swords or crusader sword katana sabers while sharing very little resemblance with the originals both in the looks and in the construction method but also in handling i mean if you look at this pretend viking sword by angel sword it's got the wrong profile wrong fuller i bet wrong distal taper wrong guard wrong pummel grip is twice as long as it should have been weight is twice as heavy as it should have been for its size and somehow they ask for four thousand dollars for that i mean if you want a viking-esque fantasy sword and you have thousands to burn wouldn't you prefer this one by fable blaze which we will cover later look at the sword not only it's got all the proportions dimensions and weight and balance mass distribution correct as a historical and practical sword also it's got immaculate execution of gorgeous designs with tasteful artistic license how is it a good financial decision to spend ten thousand dollars to have a katana that doesn't even have any correct furniture on the piece with a glued end cap falling off i mean just imagine for a second you're told that these are made in pakistan i mean people in this community will laugh their ass off they wouldn't pay ten thousand dollars for this they wouldn't pay ten bucks for this look if you know what they are and you enjoy their work you do you but for me angel sword rightfully earned their place in tier d no doubt the majority of the sword and historical martial art community will put angel sword squarely in category f or downright excluded from this list altogether but i'm a rather forgiving person and i think there is some basis to place them in tier d rather than f for the simple reason that one of their swords has been taken to a cutting competition and actually did rather well now you could say the same about some cold steel swords even with less swords provided they are sharpened well uh, especially in the beginner level of the cutting competition as those are not uh, very demanding on some agility based challenges you just need very sharpened edges and pretty much the skill of the operator of the sword and let's face it most of the time angel sword does sharpen their swords the other reason i don't place them in category f is that i have seen some of their latest offerings particularly after the death of their previous owner daniel watson and you can occasionally see a casual attempt at understanding some of the fundamentals of source physical traits such as proper quad sections mass distribution but that doesn't even apply to all of their employees just um, a minority among them 
If not for their outlandish claims, such as uh, Daniel Watson learned his source missing in the desert of Mexico from a hermit who was secretly a samurai sword master, or an angel actually came to his dream to teach him the lost secret of wood steel, or having someone penning an ill-written paper to prove that his steel is actually superior than modern homogeneous steel, or charging an outrageous sum of money for each of his ill-designed, overweight, out of balance bad swords, if you can even call them that, with minimal effort invested on each one, whether it's in research or design or execution. That will solidly place them at the bottom of even tier D. I will argue that some of the other makers, which you will see later in this video, are much more honest. And even though they sell ill-designed swords, and they still charge according to the tiny amount of labor they put in each piece. Next on the list is the Art of Fire and Iron, which is a Chinese sword making company. It has their operation located in Europe. So all of their swords are sold in euros. They are primarily a maker of Chinese and Japanese swords, but recently they've gotten into European sword making. Now, judging from the few pieces I have seen, they seem to have very good understanding of sword making. They have the correct profiles, distal taper, mass distribution, they handle very well. Master Jensen has reviewed one of their swords, type 15A or 18B. It handles rather well. Maybe it should carry a more robust tip geometry. But for the most part, they have all the hallmarks of premium swords. Edge geometry, have the correct cross-section, mass distribution, you know, the profile, and good hilt work as well, especially for their price point. So I think room for improvement, but we have to give them credit, and it's probably some of the best among the entry-level or mid-range swords uh, in terms of European sword making. So I will give them an A. Now, next one on the list is Bottle Arms, which is one of Colossina's in-house brand. They have shopped around different makers for contracts for quite some time now. The first batch, I believe it was made by OTC, which is currently being rebranded into Eric Steelcraft. Their swords have interesting designs that take heavy inspiration from historical originals. If you look at their Italian longsword, it's basically the Brescia Spadona's hilt lifted entirely, mounted on a Type 18B sword blade, and historically plausible. Especially when the original Brescia Spadona had a blade made in Passau, Germany, well, in the Holy Roman Empire at the time, but being mounted to an Italian-style sword hilt in Brescia. So, very good concept. And the original maker has some trust issues, how you say, on the steel they use. And I think their work, or rather just inconsistent. So, Cosacina terminated the contract and sought out windless steelcraft for their second batch. Second batch, um, I wouldn't say it was the improvement and the source main carries lots of windless hallmark, which we'll talk about later, which is good for the price, but not exactly great. And then they summarily terminated the collaboration with windless and sought out Liao Kei Chen for their final batch in introduced many very bold historical designs, such as the Creeks Messer and Alexandria Arsenal Sword, which I reviewed earlier in 2023, and check out those videos. I would say, unsurprisingly, given the reputation of LK Chen, which is a historical sword recreationist, mostly specialized in the Chinese sword uh, field, but also dabble in European swords lately, which we'll talk about later when we talk about LK Chen swords. They have very solid understanding of sword making, given the amount of historical originals they have examined, right? Both Chinese swords, but also swords in other you know, ethnic groups, like Japanese swords, Persian swords, but also lots of European swords. 
such as grape juice right, in their own brand. Also, LK Chen is a practitioner himself. He does a lot of swordsmanship, you know, sparring, test cutting, but also horsemanship, mounted archery. So there's no doubt the source he makes for the bottle arms really elevated this brand. Now, the design are done by Colossinus in-house designers. Then they lifted many inspirations from source designed by renowned sword makers such as Peter Johnson for Albion. And, but probably some experience learned from others like Angus Trim after their many years of handling their source, right? They sell and they're on their websites. So it caused some controversy. And after some communication, Cotacina decided to discontinue a few models that are too close to some of the Albion swords. Currently, there's only the German longsword, Italian longsword, and Templar army sword remains. And based on my experience, these are probably the best right, in this price range between 300 and 500. The best entry level swords you can possibly have. And they have extremely good mass distribution that make them handle very well, but also very faithful to originals. If you look at this Templar sword here by El Kitchen uh, for the bottle arms brand, usually for swords in this price category, you would say, oh, it's good for the money. This sword is not good for the money. It's just like a fantastic sword. You'd be happy to pay $400 for this sword, right? As the uh, MSRP, you'll be happy to pay a solid dollars or even more, right? The craftsmanship, right? The accuracy of the reproduction to the typology. This happens to be a type 10A sword from the 12th century. Extremely accurate reproduction, but it handles just like the original and probably better than the majority of them, right? They just, the ease of acceleration, stop and redirect. It's a perfect companion with, with shields in the period of combat. And I cut tatami mats with this sword at a historical European martial art club. It performed even better than many of the pieces by Albion that I used on the same day. So even probably better than the Albion Principe, which is famed to be the hallmark of competition cutting. So that tells you very much just everything you need to know. Right. If you can handle, you can own a piece right, made by LK Chen for bottle arms, do it. You will never regret. And I think they're currently working on newer models, such as a Irish ring hilt sword, and also probably having a collaboration with James Elmsley, the expert in single edge swords research field. So I have the utmost confidence of their future offerings. And if you have the chance, to own and handle their sword, I suggest you jump on the opportunity. Now, the next one is Baltimore Knife and Sword, BKS. Now, this is a difficult one because like Arms Armor, they also have their stock models, but they also have their premium custom swords made by the experts working for them. I think one is Ilya, he's a Forge and Fire champion. But first, let's talk about the stock models. Right? They are basically in the mid-range category between $500 and $800. For that price, it's a complete contrast <laughs> with the previous one when we talk about the bottle arms swords. For that amount of money, you basically get a flat sheet of steel without any sauce of correct mass distribution, cross-sections, right? correct profile, and distal taper. They just would not handle like an actual sword at all. Like they're essentially machetes. Right? They have machete constructions. One sheet steel grind a very shallow edge that does not resemble original swords in any way. Right? And they also name them like, like original sword, like naval cutlass, arming swords, crusader swords, rapiers. Now I know that they label their swords as stage combat, but I just question First of all, without the correct handling, they are often very overweight. So I don't think that's a good thing for stage combat. Let's use a, a proper Roman sword. 
Hey, you think Lucius Marinus is gonna hand Antony a BKS Gladius to commit suicide? Stage combat, right? Somehow, I don't think so. If you look at their rapiers hilt, you don't need to look at them up close. You look at them at a the distance, you will tell that they do not resemble originals. The hilt components, they are made of like one sheet of steel. They do not have the correct geometries, right? Medieval and Renaissance original swords have different cross sections, even on these hilt components, rapiers, right? They have diamond cross-sections and hexagonal, octagonal cross-sections on the swept hilt. Sometimes they're cylindrical, uh, tapered also, right? They change in thickness. They, there's ebbs and flow. There's nothing resembling that on BKS stock models. They're just essentially like a sheet of steel, water jetted into shape. Uh, if you hold them in the background, you don't ever use them, they may not look out of place, but any scrutiny, up close would just make them look horrible. I'm not even talking about the functionality. They, they will not cut, not, not much is for sure, but even if you use them in stage combat, you look clumsy. They're overweight, they, they'll handle like crowbars, and they do not work the part. Can't you get reenactment great swords from some very low budget reenactment great sword makers? And they will even look better. So it totally does not justify the price they charge, right? between five to eight hundred dollars. I do not endorse their stock models. On the other hand, the ones they make are right, custom made for customers, they charge for thousands of dollars, are usually very well crafted. And this one made for Scalagram, essentially, they are functional, and they could still be overweight, but they handle rather well. Wow! Look at that. Look at all the detail on this. That'll do it. All right. Oh yeah. The, the only the custom made project part that makes them a, a good company. So if you are talking about constant props for filming or just collector's purposes, I think you can run them an S, but as a sword making company, I'm, I'm sorry, they, I think they're basically on par with Angel Sword. And one good thing that they do right, in comparison to Angel Sword is that their swords are not overpriced. So it's reasonable, proportional to the labor that they invested. I would actually give them a C, right? Given the fine work they put in their custom work, or maybe even a B, right? It's just the good work they put in to replicating film, animes, and video game swords probably will elevate their whole ranking to B. Next up, we have Black Fencer. And I think this is primarily a maker specialized in synthetic training swords, but they have also um, steel feather swords. But recently they started offering sharp swords for cutting. Now they have one arming sword model of type 14. They also have, a, I believe a type 16A or 18B in the long sword category, just two models. And they are extremely affordable. The army sword costs two hundred fifty dollars, and long sword costs three hundred fifty dollars. For the price point, they look extremely well designed, and I haven't handled them. I hope um, they can send me some samples. But I do know that Philip Martin used their army sword in cutting competition at so-called sword fight to win a medal. I believe even it's a gold medal. Does that prove that they make good swords? I, I do believe so, because I like what I see. Have good proportions. Uh, it pays homage to historical originals. It has uh, correct stats. I haven't handled them, but since they can win cutting competitions, I would say that they are probably between A and B. 
uh, but there's such a lack of variety so far, right? They only have two models, not just two categories, but only two models. I'm probably giving them a B, and this will very well change into A or even S in the future. But currently, with only two models, that seem to be very solid for the money as entry level sort, I will give them a B. Next up, we have Badger Blades. This is another one of those so-called makers of the ilk that sell so-called swords at the Renaissance festivals. And basically just a steel flat with a very shallow bevel ground on it. Zero understanding of practical sword designs. There's no attempt at shaping the profile according to their purposes or having a distal taper correct fullers to distribute mass to make them usable. Their pieces usually have very laughable proportions, extremely short blades mounted on a long hilt, and also overweight. The only reason they're not in tier F is their pieces don't seem to fall apart the moment you pick them up, and you can probably use them as a beater to bash against uh, some concrete walls. One upside of their business is that they don't charge an exorbitant amount um, as much as Angel Sword does. So for that honesty, you get a higher place in tier D than Angel Sword does. Next up, we have Brian Curse. Um, correct me if I pronounce your name wrong. Now, this is a sword maker located in the US and he has his own workshop. He specialized in many of the swords overlooked by, by the current market of historical reproductions. Renaissance swords, such as Cinque Deia, and ones with many fullers. I have seen his work with dozens of fullers, and that's crazy amount of work. He is also a talented woodworker, so he specialized on crafting wooden hilt on some historical swords with, with that kind of hilt, like Spasa or Greek Zephos, Zephoi. If you are interested in swords with a lot of wooden components, you can do much worse. He's improving his crafts over time, and people have shown them to perform rather well. Check him out, and so far, I'll probably just rate him A+. Plus. Next, we have Carlos Caldero. I have heard about him, not too familiar with him. I assume that he does good work, uh, judging by the people who brought up his work, but I personally do not have any experience or heard any feedback from them. I would just put him in the NA category. Now, Castle Keep. This is one sword maker located in Scotland. It begs the question that whether you can separate an artist's work from himself. Now, he has some questionable political views. And when I say questionable, I don't mean anything related to the cultural war. It, it's he, he is associated closely with some far-right talking points. And quite publicly. He's also a rock singer, I believe. Um, so definitely an artist. Um, but it, And his work in sword making is quite superior. Lots of good work. It really depends on whether you can separate his views in the political realm with his personal work. Based on what I have seen and what I have heard, if I have to rank him, he'll probably in, be in the S rank, but I leave this one to you. Okay. So Castle Keep would have earned a rank S, but I just, I'm not so sure. So NA. Next one is Claw Hammer Steelworks. Now this is a newer player on the market. They are primarily a Japanese and Chinese sword maker, just like the Art of Fire and Iron, but they have recently entered into the making of European swords. Um, they have been outputting more and more new models onto the market, but they are still relatively rare. Okay, and it's not easy to acquire them, and their price point seems to be around six hundred dollars, solidly in the mid-range category. For the work they output, and I think I like their blades. They seem to have a good understanding of European swords. They have the correct mass distribution, good profile taper, good distal taper, excellent edge geometry and cross section. 
right? Sometimes a little bit um, atypical. I wouldn't say ahistorical, just atypical in cross-section and design. They don't strictly follow any typology, so keep that in mind. And they use very good steel right, for S5 shock seal, but also a Japanese two steel. Uh, also, I believe 9260 or 5160 for their sewer hardened sword blades. And they seem to be very durable based on past destructive tests done by Master Jensen. Now, they also handle very well, right, rather lightweight for their sizes. But here's the thing, they're, they're, the design, the proportion is not very typical for your European swords, but not to the point that makes them ahistorical. Some of the designs, just like the art of fire and iron, can be refined a little bit, like the tip geometry. They seem to be tapered to a very thin tip that makes them vulnerable. Right? When you have a blade tapered to be so narrow, you probably should have a reinforced tip. Otherwise, when you jab them into some tough material, you stand a good chance to bend them. So, room for improvements. I like what I see so far. So, solid A. Cold steel. Oh man, that's probably the biggest player on the reproduction market just by um, the number of their output each year. So it's important to understand that they are not a sword maker, it's a brand, right? And some people say they are a seller. I wouldn't say they are a seller like Cosacina. They're not a retailer. They, they have designs, they find contract makers who make them and output them. So they make mostly knives, but also many other historical arms including pole arms, axes, warhammers, maces, swords from various different cultures, the European swords, Chinese swords, Japanese swords, Southeastern Asian swords, West Asian swords. So a good variety for very low price, as, at least in the North America. If you buy them from Europe, um, you're going to add a considerable amount. Uh, probably even higher than their MSRP. So in that case, I will recommend against buying their swords from Europe. But in the US and Canada, they are extremely affordable, right? In, among the cheapest swords you can find on the reproduction market, right? The functional ones. And their swords are primarily designed and manufactured by two principal makers, contract makers. One is Huanwo Forge in China which is the principal forge behind the brand Dynasty Forge, okay? so, which we'll talk about soon. The other one is Windless Steelcraft. And we know this because their designs are often rehashed right, by forges and makers with their own brand, Dynasty Forge and Windless. And you see many overlaps, and we do know that's the case. So Quanwo Forge in China makes mostly Chinese, Japanese, and medieval European swords for coast steel, while windless steelcrafts makes the rest, right? European swords, military sabers, right? uh, asno swords, okay? But also there's a man and arm category. Basically it's for coast steel to allow windless to make some of the same designs, right? Usually medieval European swords as Huano Forge but has a different finish. Now, people confuse them as being the same because let's say the Italian longsword and the man at arm Italian longsword, they are based off the same design, right? And they should have the same handling characteristics, right? Same construction. Couldn't be further from the truth. The ones made in China by Huan Luo Forge not only has a different polish on the blade, right? But they also have completely different hilt con construction, but also the styles of grip wrapping are different. Some of the dimensions are drastically different, but also here's the thing. If you compare them side by side directly, there's just nothing alike. Based off the rough same design, right? the Italian longsword has the right historical mass distribution, has a distal taper, has a good amount of profile taper, has one singular primary bevel from the central ridge to the edge, well polished, right? Mirror flat finish, right? Very minimal wavering in the central ridge. And these are traits that you will find on high end reproductions like Albion source. They also have minimal gap in the hilt. So that's fantastic, right? 
but these swords made by Huano Forge, right, do not have the most historical designs. Right? Their tip geometries, um, and I will say distal taper are somewhat atypical, and that can be said about their other swords as well, and they seem to also have some very large uh, quality control variants. So some of them, actually a good number of them, have loose hilt. When you even open the box, they already have loose hilt components, and it's pretty difficult to fix them. And this can be said about Dynasty Forge swords. Their blades are generally good, but even so, there are some historical aspects. Uh, but their hilt have a lot to be desired. So for the most part, they handle within their spectrum of historical swords, right? even though they, they do not represent the, the average. And sometimes their designs are downright ahistorical. Right? Some, there's something wrong, with that, especially with the Viking sword. But the Men at Arm series are even much worse. Right? They have even cheaper construction. They do not even offer scabbard, they offer floppy sheaths. Their blades do not have the correct cross section. They do not have much distal taper at all. It has to be said that usually they are lightweight for their sizes, not overweight, but with the wrong mass distribution. They just handle pretty much like crowbars. Okay, so that reputation of, Europe, of European swords made by Cosio handle like crowbars mostly comes from the Menetar series. And that's not really the case for the regular line, right, made by Juano Forge, the Italian long swords, um, the hand and half swords, their German long swords, which is a recycled version of the Duelist made by Dynasty Forge, um, Viking swords, Norman swords. There's some historical aspects. Handling wise, they're much better than the Men at Arm series by Windless Steelcraft. And also, Windless makes lots of Renaissance and military sabers for Cosio. They are okay, right? they're, they're not great. Um, but they are functional. If you sharpen them well, and usually they're sharpened, sometimes not particularly well, but if you sharpen them well, they can cut. Uh, don't expect them to handle like historical originals because they don't have the correct mass distribution. Right? Their profiles are usually all right. Um, not completely faithful, but they're all right. But it's just the thickness, the change of the taper of the thickness is not historical, resulting in very different handling characteristics and they're, for the most part, durable, especially the ones made by windless steelcraft. And their hilt construction usually isn't a problem. Um, but they are dismissed a lot by serious practitioners. Um, but they have their place. Right? They're widely available around the world. And they're some of the cheapest entry-level sword you can have. If you buy them, you need to read a lot of reviews, watch lots of reviews. And understand you're getting into kind of risky buying experience. You can get something that's not particularly well put together, not sharpened well. But if you're lucky, you get a good one. You can even take them to some competition cuttings, right? One hand and half sword made by Juan Forge for Coast Steel, or even taken to a historical European martial art cutting competition and got into the final. So. Well, it could not compete with the like of Albion Principe. Nonetheless, it held its own as a $200 sword. So you still have to give Coastal some credit. Uh, just be aware that it's kind of like a lottery. So do your homework. And some of the recent models seem to be better. Um, they're not necessarily European swords. Sometimes they are Asian swords, like from Afghanistan or the Philippines. Um, or Indonesia, or, you know, inspired by the Asno swords. They're getting better mass distribution with more distal taper, right? which is one thing improved by windless steel craft, which we'll talk about later. So cold steel, I'll give them a rank of C <laughs> for cold steel. And I think that's more than fair. Next up, we have Crown Forge. And Crown Forge is funded by uh, the VP of Albion sword. That's um, he has done lots of research on historical original swords with Peter Johnson. Um, so you can understand the caliber of the creator at Crown Forge. 
So I would expect basically the same level of craftsmanship um, and the understanding of historical source. Eric McHugh is the gentleman's name, and I think you can basically trust his craft. So Crown Forge is a solid tier S. Next up, we have Historical Sword Zone by Damian Slowski. And this is a Polish maker. Previously, he was working with his brother, Mateusz Slowski, which is another very respected sword maker in Europe. And a few years back, he has started his own sword making business. Very cool guy. And I think he has different emphasis um, from his brothers, right, preference. He is more focusing on high medieval swords, right, from type 10 to type 14 or 16, so basically the 11th century to 13th and 14th century. And his swords are um, beloved among collectors, right, enthusiasts, practitioners, very well crafted, very clean, uh, often somewhat austere in appearance because, you know, 11th, 12th century swords should look like that. But he also makes very intricate scabbards. I think he works with his wife. Uh, excellent source, uh, no doubt, tier S. And since he's relatively new to sword making, not, not to sword making, uh, just having his own sword making business, I'll give him a tier S. Uh, I think that's more than fair. Next up, we have Dark Sword Armories, the most controversial maker in the industry, right? And they have made many enemies among sword makers and for good reasons. Um, there's some controversial practice over the years. Well, the thing you have to understand is that their swords are designed by their owner, Io, and they're not made by him or his employees. They are made by contract makers found in Asia primarily in China and India, but maybe from somewhere, somewhere else as well. And these contract makers, for the most part, are solid right, makers. And I think they are not contracted to make whole swords. They're contracted to make blades of Dark Souls Armory's in-house designs and individual hilt components. Right? I think it's fair to suggest that Io does his own research, goes to the museum, Museum museums, I don't think he has access to the back room examination of antique originals to measure them in person. You just look at them, take pictures, and you can say that Io is um, is a student of history, right? But there's some traits of personality that ultimately prevents his his endeavor right, from being a very respected one. He, there's certain pride in his work, which is good, but sometimes I think it prevents him from being humble enough you know, to learn something from his customers and from other makers, but also being honest in the source or origin. Okay? And I do believe, and I could be wrong, but I do believe their source are made uh, in Canada in certain capacities. And they claim, they, they proudly claim, their swords are made in Canada. Like this Type 18 Army sword here, um, what they call Henry V, which has some passing resemblance to the original sword that's um, claimed to be Henry V's personal sword. But there's a lot that's wrong. There's also a lot the right on this uh, example. First of all, if you do not make a sword from start to finish in Canada, that's totally okay, right? Valiant Armories is a very respected company, sword making company, and they used to make swords from bare blades they acquire from contract makers based on their own designs from China. And they're honest. They do all the hilt work in the US and they sell them and price them as such. Nobody has any complaint about it. Within the last few years, they changed their mode of operation by acquiring the equipment to do computer numerically controlled processes to mill their blade blanks. So that gives them better quality control. That gives them uh, more freedom to have very diverse designs. So that's a good thing for them, right? For Valiant Armory. And people are also happy about it, right? There's a price increase, but then now they're 
they can make more diverse source and arguably better source, right? But even if he, they kept making source, right? From mounting source order from China, right? With their local made hilts, that's not the problem. Nobody has the issue. I don't care where your source are made, right? Even if you order, bottle arm source are entirely made in China right now by LK China. You have a good maker, you should capitalize on that. You should not hide that. Okay, and this is no problem at all. Now, if you want to order components from your own design made by others and you put them together in Canada, that's not a problem at all. I don't have any issue. I don't, I don't think anyone even has any issue with that. But if you tell them your source are made in your garage, right? He made a YouTube video named How Dark Soul Armory Source Are Made. I think there's enough deniability in the video. He didn't say, oh, all the swords are made in here, but it was clear that's not a regular forge. It's all staged in the workshop. Everything is, there, there's not a lot of equipment. Everything is just loosely placed there. It does not look like an active forge. And we know that for the amount of output they have, it's not possible for him to make all these sword blanks in, in this tiny workshop. And you see that he just used hammer first. He shows a lot of footage of him putting a blank of steel in a fire and to heat them up and then just bend them without any, just bend the steel without any purpose. He shaped a tip and then that's it. There's no shaping, there's no understanding of how forging should shape the correct cross section, the correct edge bevel. To just shape, bend on the steel blank to form a tip and that's it. And they don't show anything else. They, they, they move on to the next shape uh, tip. And then they just move on to the bell grinder. And that's just not how swords are forged. Right? Forging requires you use the hammer, whether you hand hold the hammer or power hammer, to shape them and give them correct geometries. And the distal paper. There's no distal paper in his sword in that video. Right? But there are distal paper, right? usually, on his swords, on the swords he sells. These blades are not made by I.O. and his employees in Canada. These swords are ordered from contractors in China. Right? This specific one is in China. There are other, other ones being ordered from India, and we do know that Eric Steelcraft, aka OTC, does some work for them, contract work for them, uh, seen in this post that has been deleted once people discovered it. That shouldn't be a hidden knowledge. If you look at this video of theirs, purportedly showing their daily operation. They took the time to record an employee heating up a steel chunk, pouring some sand on it. But when he was about to bang on it with a hammer, it conveniently went out of focus and blacked out to a jump cut that out of the blue shows them putting the guard onto a magically materialized blade that's in a near finished state and doing merely some final polish. There's absolutely no evidence of any forging process involved with all the tiring work of shaping the cross-section, fullers, and edge bevel inch by inch. One swing of the hammer, you black out, wake up with a finished blade in your hand. Isn't that expedient? It was almost as if you had a bunch of imported bare blades sitting in the corner waiting for you to put hilt parts on. Hmm, I wonder. Look, it's not a gotcha. If you want to import all the components based on your own designs and specifications and put them together to do a touch-up work, wipe them clean and package them up to send off, like what the majority of this video actually shows, that's more than fine. I think what the community resents is this deceitful practice that attempts to mislead customers into thinking all of these are made in-house. While the so-called workshop is clearly just a warehouse where you put parts together and wrap things up, so be upfront and transparent about it. If you look at their different models, a good many have inherent design flaws built in. The Gothic longsword has a side protrusion on the guard that makes it impossible to perform German longsword techniques. The Kriegsmesser has a noggle in the wrong place, making the sword practically ungrippable. The Henry V sword, this one over here, has a grip far too long. 
so do all of their Viking era swords. If you look at their reproduction of the Zundaga sword from the National Museum of Finland, the hill is comically inaccurate and out of proportion. Total disregard of proper usage. If you look at the Albion Kingmaker here, you see of the same type, far more accurate, of the English arming sword here. You see it has the correct grip plans. This is how you're supposed to use the sword, right? With half your palm by the side of the pommel, of this wheel pommel. This is how it's supposed to be gripped. When this is too long, you simply cannot do that. Okay? Loop the pinky finger above the guard, but with some of your palm side side by side with the pommel. You cannot do that with this one. Look, it's simply far too long if you try to do that. Grab your palm around it and with uh, pinky above the wheel pommel. You see it's too far away from the cross guard. Therefore, artificially lengthen this uh, point of balance right, away from your hand. Make it less maneuverable. And if you do it like this, this will collide wheel pommel with your forearm when you take the sword. And all of their type 10, 11, 12, and 13 blades have the wrong cross section to feature the incorrect central ridge when they should have lenticular ones. Not to mention many models are overweight and wildly out of balance. But even when the designs are sound, the frequent switching around various contract makers essentially makes buying their sword a lottery experience. You will get a good one if you're lucky. Otherwise, you will have to be one of their fans, hang the sword on the wall, never even to unsheath them, just to believe they are the best swords out there. Or getting a maddeningly non-functional sword that will not perform, or even potentially hurt you when you use it as a sword. The wild inconsistency is on display when Master Jensen received an Alexandria sword that weighs three and a half pounds and handles relatively well. A few months later, they lost access to that contractor forge and made the first batch for them and switched to another. Suddenly, customers are getting the same model weighing four and a half pounds without any distal taper. To measure the mass, um, and this is pretty damned heavy, this Alexandria uh, replica, at over 1,900 grams. That's uh, quite a bit over four pounds, about 4.2 pounds, I think. The person behind Gentleman's Choice YouTube channel was a major fan of Dark Sword and did a review of this sword. He was visibly in agony as he was dying to love the sword, but the sword simply handles nothing like the one he ordered. He deleted his entire channel after that. Arthur from Mr. Caliber channel was an even bigger devotee of Dark Sword, as he bought dozens of them. He had tragically passed away last year, and for the final review of the Baron Sword, he requested some footage of Dark Sword Armory actually forging the sword he ordered as a sort of a final wish. You know what Dark Sword did? They sent him a picture of them sliding a guard onto the tent. So was Arthur's final wish honored? You tell me. I think lately the company is trying to push some genuinely interesting models, uh, such as a few Oakshot Type 20 swords, which are rather rare on the reproduction market. There are some respectable efforts at capturing the unique cross section of the blade, even though Dark Source models are usually poor cutters as they lack the understanding of proper edge geometry. Some of their contractor forgers are more competent than others and are capable of outputting legitimate swords, provided they are given adequate designs to begin with. This Henry V sword is pretty good on the blade portion, but has an incorrectly shaped hilt. <laughs> but for $700 to $900, I just don't think it warrants the investment simply to test your fortune. You are almost guaranteed to get a better sword from many makers on higher tiers for a lower price, such as this Albion Squire line knightly sword here, uh, costs less than 500, and a far, far superior sword. You know, the bottle arms, LK Chan, the European swords, just, there's no comparison. Right? Dark sword even isn't on the same level with them. So for all the practices of questionable ethics and the wild inconsistency, they get a C and I'm being incredibly generous here, as I'm sure many in the community 
are eager to place them in tier D or F. Next up, we have Dark Wood Armory. And this is a maker uh, has been putting out mostly sports fencing level of um, blonde swords, mostly rapiers, but also like cutlass and such. I think they can make sharp swords if you custom commission from them. And I have handled their swords at um, uh, Academy Duello Hema Club. And their swords feel just wonderful. Okay. Um, I'm not so sure how good their sharp swords are, but if that's how they make their blunt swords for sports fencing, like I say sports fencing, it's just HEMA, right? Sparring or form training, they will be very good. And I think their prices are not very high. And to me, I think that's a solid A. And yeah, I'll say they'll probably even be four. The two Chinese makers? Yes. Next up, we have the Pika. Okay, so that thing, that's, um, they claim their swords to be battle ready, uh, made of high, high carbon steels, uh, pinned. Check all the, the basic boxes, you know, it's all the buzzwords for entry level collectors, sword buyers. Um, but their swords, they, have been the subject of ridiculing among serious practitioners and collectors for a very good reason. They are a very low cost brand from India to make primarily reenactment great swords. Okay, if you do not use them, you hang them on the wall. Although I do not recommend them uh, for war hanging, they're not the best art you can you can hang on your wall. Uh, but if you just carry them. By your by your side, and going to Ren Fest, right, Renaissance festivals, or some historical reenactment, most of their models are gonna do fine. Right? They're not gonna fall apart when you see some some casual clashing with other blunt sword will not break them, since they're made of uh, EN forty five, which is just a low cost uh, steel, very commonly used by Indian low cost makers. Um, they their swords do not have the, the correct distal taper. Usually they have none, um, which makes their swords do not handle like originals at all. Usually overweight, but sometimes underweight. It's just a flat bar of steel. This I have to give it to them. Their swords have the correct cross section, right? For the type, if it's a diamond cross section, it'll make you a sword, a, a blade of diamond cross section, right? It's just exactly no cross section. They're gonna do that, right? They can do different cross sections. They'll do the fullers, not very accurately, not looking too much like the originals, but the profile and many of the aspects in the just in the appearance that doesn't make them too bad. I'll say that if you go to reenactment, right, take some photos. If you are just standing in the background and not letting people inspect your sword up close, they'll probably do fine. Right. Also, if you're a filmmaker, uh, you want to have some historical, you know, uh, subjects in your film. If you have all of your background characters uh, holding Albion swords. It's gonna cost you a fortune. It, assuming that you have a hundred men at arms, are they gonna all be equipped with Albion swords or you know swords made by you know specialty prop makers? That's gonna cost you a lot of money. Right? But the Pika, especially their most recent offerings, if you just look at them in the background, they, they look the part. Right? There's nothing that stands out that screams. A historical that that's not a sword, right? Their swords look look I'm, I'm emphasizing look look better than angel swords or uh, BKS stock model. Right? But if you sharpen them to do some test cutting, they'll probably hold up for a while. But since they are not heat treated for that purpose, you eventually gonna break. And if you look at Master Genesis review of the Pika sword, it was sharpened by Kalsina. It could cut some models. And he smashed it on his wood, uh, and the tip broke off. I think in my in my book that's not acceptable to be battle ready. Um, but then if you do not abuse them, it's unlikely they'll fall apart. They still have the relative correct construction, uh, pinning, uh, etc., etc. They might come loose if you abuse them. They might break, but otherwise they are relatively durable. Right? I'll give them a D for that. 
and that's basically for all the reenactment grade makers. Next up, we have Deltine, and you can see this is my Deltine Venetian Spadone here, uh, Renaissance two-handed sword. This is one old guard sword maker from Italy, and they do not forge their blades, they use stock removal primarily, and their swords are very diverse, all the way from the antiquity, you know, Roman swords, Gladi, uh, Spase, and also uh, Migration Era swords. He has quite a few models for that period. Viking Era swords, early medieval swords, um, and then the medieval ones, Renaissance, um, all the way to 17th century, right? With hangers, uh, dusaks, uh, Venetian military swords, etc. Very diverse. So you can order some rare types for not a lot of money from them. For the money, their swords are good. They have the correct shape, geometry, hill components, not always constructed in the most historically accurate way, but they are made to look like uh, historical originals. Many of their swords have the uh, correct mass distribution to handle like original ones. Some of their models do not, right? Um, but they are generally priced between $400 and $800, so solidly in the mid-range um, reproduction market. Now, back in the 80s and 90s, Deltine was the golden standard for reproduction source. Now, you probably don't know this, but even Albion once used Deltine blades on their Mark I generation swords before they transitioned to in-house productions. Um, they don't make swords sharp, so if you want to cut with them, you have to sharpen them, they have a very thick, blunt edge, I think it's illegal to make sharp swords uh, in Italy. And that can be said for all the Italian makers on this list. But for me, personally, for the diversity they offer, for the amount of time they are in the market, but also consider that some of the swords they make has some minor inaccuracy right, to the originals, I will give them a B. Next up, we have Dynasty Forge, or Dynasty Forge. Uh, this is a venture uh, to sell swords in the West, Western market, um, by Juan Wall Forge, the owner of Juan Wall Forge, I believe. Or they probably even have a few other forges to do high-end Japanese swords for them. But for European swords, they are considered mid-range, uh, basically between $500 and $700. Um, recently, I think they have stopped making swords, mostly focusing on doing contract work for cold steel. And the few models they uh, offer, Type 16A, uh, Type 18B swords, since being adopted by cold steel as their German longsword with a, a longer guard, but with a larger side ring welded to it in a very bizarre way. But for the most part, their blades are good, good polish, very crisp lines. Right? This can be said about Cold steels and medieval swords as well. Not always historical, right? And sometimes it's just, for some reason, overweight and without the correct distal taper. I mean, other models, they are pretty good. And one central theme um, that's shared with cold steel swords, medieval swords, is their reliability in the hilt. They tend to come loose. And since they are pinned most of the time, it's very hard to fix them. If you have the threaded pummel, you can tighten it and pretty much it'll tighten the grip and the cross guard. But if you're pinned, if the palm is pinned, there's very little you can do about it other than disassemble the whole thing and then repin it, which is extremely difficult. Um, so for all that and the price they charge, I was saying you probably give them a C, same as Cold Steel swords. Also, their swords are priced a little bit higher than Cold Steel. So I would say that is definitely a C. Next up, we have Algor, or Algor. This is a sword maker from Czech Republic, or Czechia. And his work is highly respected within the community, and collectors enjoy his work. I've seen his sword with a custom designed intricate hilt by my sword friend, Jean-Paul. Unfortunately, this sword was stolen um, in the summer of 2023 during the riots uh, in France. Very well crafted, good.
bit understanding of sword making, so I will give him an S. Next up, we have Antifer. Or Antifer. Antifer is run by Polish swordsmiths Jan Hobkiewicz, who happened to be a competitive HEMA practitioner, specialized in longsword, messer, and Polish saber. He has his own sword making business, primarily focusing on Polish sabers and long swords, um, mostly fetish swords, very high end fetish swords, usually priced between $600 and, and $800. Um, that happens to be more expensive than Albion's fetish long swords. And he also makes sharp swords, sharp Polish sabers and long swords. You can see here, he does a test cutting on pork ribs with two separate gambison. Cuts through two gambisons and into the pork rib and cut, boom. So you can say this is one person that understand fencing, understand sword making, given the amount of fencing he does himself, and he's probably a high level competitor. So I would say give Young a um, solid tier S. Next up we have Fable Blades. Fable Blades is run by Australian sword maker Brendan Ozawi. He has been making both fantasy and historical swords of crazy complexities. Of course, he is capable of also making swords of austere look and feel. But why would you settle for that when you can have this? True heirloom level swords with the most intricate details. Hand carved almost like jeweler's work. You assume that these are really pretty jewelries, wall hanging arts, and they wouldn't function as swords. And you would be wrong. Brendan himself is an avid sword enthusiast. He has done test cutting on many media. And if you look at each project page of his, he lists all the details with the utmost transparency. Everything from weight to balance, profile paper, distal paper, he lists it all. And even the steel use, the heat treatment details, and even the hardness of the blade are listed. So you can tell this is one person with hell a lot of knowledge about swords. If you have all the cash to burn, sky is the limit, obviously. And I often get lost while admiring his work in the galleries. Looking at the photos of his work just ruins swords for me. And I have to make myself stop. Everybody will agree he should be ranked as tier S. Next, we have Dr. Fabrice Cognon. So this is a highly respected French maker and he has access to many museum originals, does lots of research work, just like Peter Johnson. Um, just highly regarded uh, among his peers. Okay. What's interesting is that Fabrice Cognon focuses on recreating rather unique pieces, uh, such as swords with different and unique geometries, or hybrids between swords and pole arms. Also, obviously, he has recreated many pole axes, pole hammers, and percussive weapons, often with good complexities, such as surface engraving, but he mostly emphasizes on recreating pieces that look the part, that resembles museum originals. That often means leaving flaws, imperfections, such as file marks, pitting, minor asymmetry on blades and heel components. It has to be said that this emphasis isn't the preference of every modern collector. However, if you are a serious student of the sword and history, you will appreciate that. So I think it's rather uncontroversial to rank Fabrice Cognio as tier S. Next up, we have what Fabrice Cognio calls the legendary Gale Fab, who is highly respected among his peers. His works are much beloved within the community, given their impeccable historicity and craftsmanship. Just work of art. And I mean, look at these, look at the attention to detail and the level of fit and finish.
you would indisputably be in tier S. Next up, we have Cass Hanway. Cass is a distribution company in the West. Hanway is a sword company's name. So Hanway is one of the old guard of sword making uh, situated in China. They started making Japanese swords from the 1980s and then expanded uh, to other swords like Chinese swords, European swords, very diverse, all the way from Viking era to the Renaissance. I don't think they make sabers, military sabers, early modern swords, but uh, they have a very wide range of offerings. Um, I think you have to look at specific models. Uh, in their early years, they made some very badly designed swords, a few of them, like the so-called Henry the Fifth swords that doesn't share a lot of resemblance with the actual original. Some like war swords, it's just very generic sounding swords. And they have totally wrong cross section and the wrong profile. Proportions are very bizarre, but only a few models. And then uh, they have received competent counsel from sword makers like Michael Tinker Pierce. So Tinker Pierce has his own line uh, at Hanway to reproduce a few of his designs. And those swords are very well crafted for between $200 and $250 and $300 you have an excellent sword right? that's crafted with uh, all the correct cross-section, mass distribution, good edge geometry. Sometimes they're not particularly sharp, but it's very easy to sharpen them up to perform well. Uh, one thing is that they, some of them are pinned, others are threaded, and the ones threaded, um, like this Hanway Tinker Bastard Sword here, tends to come loose after a while. The good thing is that they can be rather easily tightened is a Allen wrench, and they handle pretty well. Right? They just some some of them are better than others, but they also handle on par with historical originals. Well, those are good, but some of the other models like this Cowwood sword, 12th century, 12th to 13th century type 12th sword, extremely accurate with lenticular cross section, the correct fuller width, lens handles extremely well. It's beautifully crafted with very accurate uh, hilt construction, very accurate hilt components uh, with the original. It's just a, like a fan favorite sword, right? highly regarded in the community. Right? All the categories, you know, just hilt construction are very tight. Um, some of the choices like the leather color and the hilt wrapping style are not favorite are not favored by everybody but you can easily rewrap this i like it it looks very different also has this bridge very unique um riser on the hilt i think this is an excellent offering especially for the price but they also offer many direct replicas of historical originals that are extremely you know cost efficient they're not exactly cheap right they're Price usually between $300 and $800, and even sometimes even pricier. Some of the earlier models, like Charlemagne Sabre, um, with very premium material, I think back then it cost more than $1,000. Just very well crafted swords, okay? But even their basic models are generally reliable. Sometimes they have some issues with heat treatment. Um, I think there's one even, like, Hanwei Tinker Pierce, practice sword, even broke at the well, pen during filming. Uh, that's really bad for their reputation, but they tend to correct their mistakes very soon. Sometimes their blades have deviated a little bit further away from the design, and the designer, Michael Tinker Pierce, had a chat with them, and I think they sorted out um, within no time. But just be aware of that as a mass production company, they have large output, right? All bit smaller than cold steel and with less steel craft. Still, they all put many swords and there's a chance that you got a lemon. And if that happens to be the case, make sure you contact them. Uh, 
to give them a chance to set things right. And they offer many diverse models like the Renaissance Lens Connect Casbalger, which is a good sword with the correct cross section. It right, handles very well, good in proportions, and hilt construction, good choice of the original to replicate. Hanway Saint Maurice is another excellent reproduction of uh, original sword housed at Vienna. It's a very close replica of the long bladed Type 11 arming sword. Weight and balance, mass distribution, and uh, hilt components geometries are extremely close to the original. So I will give them a solid B. Next on the list, we have Hongshu. Man, this is a difficult one. Hongshu is a brand started by United Cutlery. They wanted to do some tactical version of modern construction, inspired loosely by um, historical swords like katanas. Their first brand was called Hongshu Boshin. And Hongshu just means the main island, the biggest one uh, in Japan. Right. Hongshu Boshin in history is a reform um, to modernize Japan. So that basically tells you their original intention is to have a modernized version of historical swords, especially Japanese swords. Over time, they expanded into European sword, um, but basically they held the same design philosophy. And they sent me their gross master, the modern tactical version. And I, I have to say, I did not enjoy it, regretfully. Um, there's, the design shows very little regard to historical originals. There's no understanding of what makes a Greek semester. There's no distal paper. The cross-section is completely wrong. I mean, with very short bevel to the edge, basically has like machete construction. Like some of the makers later in the list, not well regarded, shall we say. And that one, also has a pummel broken off when I did some abusive tests. And now I have seen many of that pummel broke off at the strand. And luckily their grip is pinned to the, uh, to the tail of the sword. So your sword blade would not come out flying after the pummel fall, falls off. But that's a, still a catastrophic failure from everything I have seen. I would not recommend the Hongshu Boshin line, but then in 2021, they started a Hongshu historical, it's called Historic Forge, I think it's historical, right? And they actually um, improved over time. They work with windlass. All the swords are being made by windlass steel crafts. And since windlass is improving their crafts over time, um, Hongshu is improving theirs, <laughs> right? Um, they get some advice from windlass, some input from windlass on their designs. The first one didn't go well. The first one is a hand and a half sword that weighs five and a half pounds, which is a fail. But they immediately corrected that and, and lowered the weight to three and a half pounds. Still heavy, but within the historical range. And after that, the newer models have even better weight and weight distribution. They consulted me personally, uh, Claymore. I give them the desirable weight and balance and weight distribution, you know, the cross section. Um, but also distal taper, and they think that um, it's difficult for windless steel craft to do exactly that. But they took my advice uh, to keep that weight and balance and have some degree of distal taper on that. I reviewed that sword, and they sent me a review sample. I didn't think I would like it, but I do like it. It's not perfect, but it performed well. It handles pretty well. It's rather lightweight for a two-handed sword pretty large, and I think it's much better than the Man at Arm series uh, Windlass makes for Cozy, much, much better. So I think that um, as this line progresses over time, it'll get better, right? And also, Hongshu has contracted OTC, Eric Steelcraft, the previous maker for Bottle Arms, to make some more historical designs. Um, some of their designs are like clearly a ripoff of Albion ideas. But I've seen reviews by Alien Dude seems to be doing a good job. And they seem to have, as by accident or intent, they have improved over the first generation of bottle arm swords. So I would think that that earns them a tier C. But then if they keep improving, 
could elevate them into tier B. And also that their swords are rather affordable, right? Entry-level swords are priced between $200 and $300. You have to take the price into consideration. Next up, we have Incarious Craft, or Incarious Craft. So uh, that's a business owned by Raffle from Poland, I believe. This is a relatively newer maker. Uh, he has a large presence on Etsy, which is rather rare. He makes various medieval swords um, from earlier types, type 12 or so, all the way to type 16, 18, you know, 18 C. So he's a, he has a good diversity in his offerings and you can cut some commission from him. And his price, his prices are rather reasonable, right? Comparing to other Polish smiths. Um, from what I have seen, multiple examples, uh, keep in mind this is from this is on his work from a few years back. He seemed to mostly employ a convex distal taper. And this is a little concerning. Makes his sword a little, shall we say, like I wouldn't say tip heavy, right? I wouldn't say I would say meso heavy. If it's already heavy in this region below the tip, it's called the foible, the weak. You don't want to parry at this portion because the leverage dictates that it will be pushed back. But it's the ideal cutting portion. You want this part to land on target because it carries the most amount of tip speed. You don't want the middle part, the mezzo, to be too heavy. Okay, It should be tempered to have significantly less weight than the base. Not, not as much as the, the foible, obviously. His source tends to not taper as much from the base in the middle section. So it feels, it'll feel a little weird, right? It's not, they don't feel clumsy, but they, they do not feel as good as some of the other makers work, okay? And they do look very good, right? Like higher end swords. And I think I see a tendency of making the grip very thin. Um, I think that's a mistake. If you want your sword to handle well, you should have, you should not have very bulky grip and right? to spread the fingers apart. You should also not make grips that's overly thin. That's also not conducive to good handling. So I think he can improve upon that. Maybe his more recent work are better, right? But for the most part, looks very good, right? Good, especially good for the money. Um, price generally between $700 and $1,200. It depends on whether you order a scabbard. Uh, so for that, I would give him an A, right? I would say probably, yeah over here right next up we have jeffrey robinson this is primarily a bronze worker okay and he's clearly an enthusiast of swords he has made many fantasy swords by reholding albion blades albion sword blades so, uh, such as type 17 type 12a etc and the hilt work he does uh, are excellent okay so but they tend to be a little bit heftier than the original. So keep in mind that it will shift the balance closer to the hill. So it will not be completely identical to the original sword. But they look excellent. Right? He also seemed to be able to fabricate blades himself. Right? He makes as a tribute to the Conan's Atlantean sword. Mostly a solid S. Right? Not as diverse as some of the historical sword recreationists, I would say. But as a fu functional fantasy sword maker, I think that would definitely place him in tier S. Next up, we have James Elmsley from Scotland. Uh, he's an expert in single-edge swords research field. He's very knowledgeable and very active member of the community. He frequently shares his knowledge, right, deep knowledge. You also probably have heard of the Elmsley typology of falchions and messers. Yes, and that's his work. And I think for that, he definitely deserves a tier S and a very good reproductions. He takes constant order. Lately, he also designed some swords for bottle arms to make. Right? He also provides console to video game developers such as myself. So I'll say, you know, how much cooler a guy can be. So definitely, tier S. Next up, we have John Lundemo. 
And this is an uh, excellent sword maker. I have every single one who has handled his, his work have high praises for a demo. He's a rock singer uh, based in Long Island, New York. Uh, very cool guy and has designed mostly fantasy swords um, inspired by historical examples. He handles very well, performs extremely well. So I will say Long Demo definitely gets a tier S and not the most prolific sword maker, I would say. You get a chance to handle his work once in a while. He makes swords inspired by all sorts of historical examples, right? From different ethnic origins, Chinese, Japanese swords, um, Filipino swords. Right? I've seen him making a fantasy gnoting and extremely cool offerings. Just yeah, some buff for sure. Next up, we have Josh Davis of Davis Reproduction. So this is not just a sword maker, just like Arms Armor. He does lots of work of uh, pole arms, like pole hammers, extremely high-end reproduction of pole hammers, um, but also armor. And I believe he's into armored fighting in full plate harness himself. Uh, good understanding of swords, but also historical arms and armor. From everything I've seen, unless anyone offers any counterpoint, I would say that um, definitely, Josh Davis gets in tier S. Next up, we have Casey Long, uh, another highly respected sword maker. And I have not handled his work, but I have seen a lot of his work on display. Um, I will go ahead and give him a tier S. And I don't think I'll receive any pushback from that. Next up, we have Kingdom of Arms. Kingdom of Arms is a new brand created by Lexi Arms Gen 2, previous owner. They source their products from a Filipino forge. I think it was, I don't know whether it is share any commonality with BCI, Blade Culture International, but basically Lexi Arms Gen 2 previously was also a Filipino uh, maker. They have some designs by Bruce Brookhart, and basically is like a rain actor, I think. Also does some historical sword fighting. Uh, their swords are rough in appearance, shall we say. They are also placed in a rather high price category, usually around eight hundred dollars, including scabbard. I would say, right? And you have to consider that because a scabbard usually will cost a lot if you commission them from anybody in the U.S. or Europe. But uh, their swords look interesting, right? Some of the models are not, they are historically inspired, but I'm not so, I'm not so stoked about their historicity. Right? Others, right, the, the more recent offerings look better, um, but I can just say they probably, they probably do not justify the price they charge. Otherwise, I, I have some detailed measurement on some of their fantasy swords. Um, one replicating the ranger sword from Lord of the Rings, uh, the Aragorn's ranger sword. But if you compare the stats, uh, the appearance, to the one offered by Valiant Armories, right, designed by Angus Trim, and Sunny Saddles right, on the hilt, they, they're just, they're, it's not a lot of comparison. It's not on the same level at all, which is not really surprising because the Valiant Armory one uh, costs about twice as much. Still, uh, I will probably put, place them in. They they do a lot of ace historic offerings like the Gladius they, with the fuller. There's no evidence that Gladius, any Gladius, had any fuller. Just do a cross section, a diamond cross section, or a lenticular cross section. Right? Uh, I I don't think you can do a fuller on a Gladius blade and still call it Gladius. But otherwise, they're not they're not that bad, right? I will place them. Probably in tier B. Right. Next up, we have Kingston Arms. So this seems to be an offshoot of Cast Hanwei because it's also located in Dalian, China. And they have lots of offerings, 
previously done by Hanway. Even some of the sources itself, branded as Kingston Arms, they have the etching of Cass Hanway on the, the Ricasso, the base of the blade. So it's probably a subsidiary or offshoot of Hanway. They also, they are called Dragon King um, of their Japanese sword offerings. Okay. I think some of the first offerings by Kingston Arms are not well designed. Uh, they're heavy with a lot of distal taper. They look all right, but it's just not great. And nobody really buy them. And then they started working with Angus Trim. Angus Trim designed a few models for them. Um, I think three or four uh, arming swords. There's one hand and a half swords of type uh, 13C or 13A, a shorter version of type 13A, Great Sword of War. They tend to have good uh, geometries, cross-section, inherited lots of the Hanway traits, but they are, they have, somehow they have bad edge geometries, and I don't know why, because usually Hanway has good edge geometries. They seem to be made blunt and then have a very shoddy sharpening job on it. It's a very jarring secondary bevel. Uh, I have a um, Kings and Arms Type 14 sword designed by Angus Trim, and I think it handles extremely well, just over two pounds. It's not extremely uh, typical for Type 14 swords, even though it's, yeah, it, it has a short, short blade. It's, it's also quite broad at the base, but it doesn't have the very stereotypical flare shoulder in the base. But otherwise, you know, the fuller and, you know, the cross section has a central ridge, right, which is found on some of the Type 14 swords, right, categorized by York Oakshot. It handles really well, but craftsmanship is also um, pretty good, yeah, especially for $300. But, man, the, the edge geometry is not good. It, this, for me to sharpen it, one edge, Took about 40 minutes to reprofile. Right now it's very sharp, but if you do not do the sharpening yourself, this is not gonna cut anything. You're not gonna have a good time with test cutting. And I think that's one of the categories, right? The performance in test cutting and test thrusting, and how, how a sword should hold up in that. It doesn't do well, but if you sharpen it like I did, it would do well. They are basically on cast handways, level, but just keep in mind that you want to do a, some work on their source, right? And I only, I recommend their Angus Trim design source, but also some of their older models like the Renaissance size swords and the Kaspalgers are really good as well, right? But basically they're Hanway swords. So I will place them at tier B. Next up, we have Krieger Historical. Now, Krieger Historical makes some arming swords and messers. They look pretty good, um, but a little bit generic. Okay, and I have also seen long sword type 15A long swords made by them, not having a lot of distal taper. They are just like some of the swords made by other Eastern European sword makers, right? not the ones of the highest caliber. They tend to have a like a very lazy half distal taper. There's no distal taper in the lower half of the blade. And then it only tapers from the midpoint to the tip. And if you have a profile like type 15A, it would probably be okay. It would not handle like a 15A sword. I would prefer them not to do that. But um, it will work as a sword. And their source looks, you know, the hilt construction looks okay. And But I hope that they, they'll correct some of the you know, inaccuracy in the weight distribution. And I think given that they are a relatively new player in the market, and they can do that. Some of the shorter swords, like long messers, probably will be fine, right? And they, because when you have a short sword, you can get away with lesser distal taper. So I will give them the tier B for that. 